Aloha, I'm Wendy Lowe, and today we'll be taking your health back, streaming live from our studios in Think Tech Hawaii in downtown Honolulu, and from my home office in Makiki. I met a man who is passionate about God, his lovely wife of about 40 plus years, and the ohana around him. Let's discover this man who is living life to the fullest. His name is Gary Cotery. Welcome, Gary. Aloha, Wendy. Wendy, thank you so much. What a blessing. Thank you. Aloha. I've been, I mean, I, I met you um, a couple years ago, and every time I listen to you, I'm very intrigued with what comes out of your mouth and the sheer determination of making your home Hawaii great again. And so I've always wanted to have you uh, uh, just to come and discuss what's going on and what is the health of Hawaii's um, housing and you know and, and, and politics here in Hawaii so I'm glad that you're here with us so let's get started Gary and let's just tell me about your ohana well thank you Wendy I you know it's so exciting to be on the program I just love I love your joy I love who you are and I love all that you're involved in and so uh, it's just really great and blessing to be here I, you know my ohana you mentioned in your your introduction that I've been married for 41 years to really the, the woman of my youth. I, I got married when I was 21 and she was 17 and people were like, really? But it, uh, it's been wonderful. You know, it was a lot of years of learning to get to know each other and learning to say how, how to say I'm sorry and will you please forgive me? But through it all, through reconciliation and grace and, and life and, you know, having kids and raising them and now grandkids, it's been uh, more than I can imagine. Uh, we're just so, I'm so blessed, so thankful. You know, like I mentioned, Kim and I were married in 1980. Uh, we moved to Hawaii in 1981. Her folks lived here in Waikiki. So we came here on extended vacation. At the time, I was in construction way back even then, back in the, in the late 70s, I was in construction, and, but I traveled. And uh, my travels really didn't lend themselves to a good marriage scenario. You know, it was difficult. I would be come home only on the weekends and it, so it was hard to get to know each other. But after a year, uh, providentially, we came to Hawaii. We stayed and we met great friends in Kulio'o and joined in family and learned Ohana and learned what Aloha meant. And we were just embraced and loved. And it was so fabulous. We had such good friendships immediately. It wasn't like we had to build them over years. We found them natural. And uh, it was just amazing, uh, the grace that was extended to us. And and uh, then ultimately, obviously, in the 86, in 1986, our first daughter was born, Rachel. And then following a year and 17 months later, Erica was born. And it was a big change. We had lived in Waikiki at the time, like most young people who come to Hawaii. We had lived in Waikiki. And, and uh, so we had this, uh, you know, 400 square foot place in Olakele, you know, in Mo'ili'ili. We lived in there. And, and uh, we had started the business at that time, doing work at Pearl Harbor and Hickam Air Force Base and had the kids and then realized, wow, we need to make some changes. And so ultimately we moved to the windward side in Kailua. We, we came through the poly and you know, when you drop out of the poly, you just see the windward side. It was just like a- Beautiful oh. colors of blue, beautiful. It was so fantastic. And we were fortunate enough, we were able to get an FHA mortgage and, and uh, buy a home in Kala Hill Hillside. And so we lived there for 20 years. Rose, our kids were raised there. And, and, you know, we developed more and more relationships in the Windward Side and youth groups and soccer and all the things, beach days and uh, just fabulous years. We, the kids grew and they went to school at Trinity and then St. Mark's and ultimately Kalaheo and Hawaii Baptist. And then they went off to college, uh, you know, off to, off to Oregon uh, after high school and, but Kim and I, through it all, we've met so many amazing and wonderful people, people who are generous in their love, uh, you know, honest in their conversations. People would have heartfelt conversations that would actually touch you when you could actually have somebody say something that wasn't that easy to hear and know that it was for your well-being. Right. And to have friends like that are a treasure. Friends are a treasure. And so I have many. I don't have many like hundreds, but I have a handful of friends who have... Uh, who have impacted my life with their authentic love. And, and obviously my wife is my greatest and closest friend. So it's wow. been fantastic. Wow, that's a healthy marriage if I ever heard of one. And you know, both you and Kim, I mean, you were kids. You, should, you were right. 21 years old, you know, and that, that's a young man. That's a very young man. And you know, to, to find love at that young age and to just know that she's the one. So 
I know you have a healthy marriage and I know communication and love and faith is all mixed into it. What advice would you give to a young couple these days? I mean, with all the different challenges, I know you had some challenges as well, but these days it's, it's, it's quite tough. So is there any advice that you would give to have a healthy relationship into a healthy marriage down the line? What, what can you say to these young people? Well, that's a great question. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I think the most important part with regard to a relationship, whether it's marriage or outside the marriage, is that you can talk honestly, that you can share what's really there, that there's a form of, you know, we say into me, see, but I say it's into me, you see. <laughs> I love it. I better write that down. <laughs> You'll actually allow to people see the oh. in, share the stuff that you don't want people to see. There's things that I'm not proud of and the, thing, the many things that I don't want people to see. But to those who I've actually exposed and let them see into me, they're never shocked. Mm. It's such an honor to be involved in another person's heart. And for a young couple, honest conversations, not having things in the closet, getting them out before kind of having honest conversations and realizing that we're all fallen. None of us are perfect. That our value doesn't come from my job or my paycheck. My value comes from the one who made me. And that means it, I can extend that grace and love to any human being. It doesn't have to be, they don't have to perform one, they have to do a single thing to know that who made them gives them more value than I could ever assign a human being. And so, uh, and I would say with regard to the young marriage thing, be honest and account for your mistakes. Just, be, just say, hey, you know what? I did this. And when you say, I, you don't say, I'm sorry. It's, will you please forgive me? Yes. It's a question. And you actually empower the other person to say, yes, I forgive you. And something supernatural about the grace of God, he just washes it away. When there's actually a cleansing and a repentance, and then there's a reconciliation that happens. I can remember with Kim and I, we would fight till the middle of the night. We were just, you know, <laughs> I got to be right here. And you would break down of the sheer exhaustion and say, oh, God, help me find my way. And so I, if I had two nuggets, uh, be honest and account. Wow. Everyone, you better be writing that down. Tutus, parents, write it down because that's the words of wisdom you need to pass to the next generation. So, you know, what um, intrigued me a lot when I heard you speak uh, and I hear your story all the time, when I met you, I asked you about your grandchildren and I know you have a bunch of them. You have two daughters and you have a, a few grandchildren. And um, where are they? You know, I asked you, where are they? And then you kind of stopped and looked at me and it looked like you wanted to cry. This man of joy wanted to cry. And then when I asked you about your grandchildren and where are they residing, please yeah. share with us, where did they go and why? Yeah, you know, it is, a, it is a point of, you know, there's a lot of stuff that comes up because I don't get to be with my grandkids. You know, three and a half years ago, my one daughter, Erica, has four boys and Rachel, our older daughter, has two boys and a, and a girl. So she's now the princess, obviously. Out of the seven, we got one granddaughter. So she's, she's the queen of the roost. But three and a half years ago, you know, they were living paycheck to cha paycheck. They were, you know, one, one misstep and they, they didn't have the money to pay their bills. And uh, they wanted to have their kids in private school. They, did, they didn't feel comfortable about the, the process, the education, the curriculum here in Hawaii. So they had their kids at a Christian school, but it was still expensive. And one kid was, you know, whatever it was, let's say it was 500. I know it was more than that, but it was 500. And then two was 1,000. And then they began to see the ride. And I have four. And how's this going to work? And they began yeah. to think and talk with each other and, they, and realize that what they really wanted for their family is they really wanted a legacy of freedom. They wanted liberty for their kids. They wanted their kids to grow up in a community like they grew up in. Right. And so ultimately they decided we had a family meeting and, and uh, they, they kind of just had to tell Kim and I, uh, we wept for a year for real. Yes. And uh, even in the moment, it's like, uh, I, I miss my grandkids. There's a part of this, there's a part of Ohana in life. That's, there's a legacy piece that happens between parents and kids, grandparents kids and grandkids and great grandparents, par grandparents, kids and grand great grandkids. That piece is missing for us right now. Right. Okay. Our kids are, are 11 to four. And uh, I, I have great concerns about not participating in their lives right now. I, it really, it really churns on my insides. So. Well, wow, and that's a big chunk. I mean, you know, your children, your daughters are grown, but it's the grandkids now that was going to feel that that why we are retired and or retiring. So we have all this time to play and hug them and just 
mentor them and love them as we should. So I can feel your pain and I felt it that time. So I knew I wanted to just share with that because I know many families here in Hawaii are experiencing the same, you know, um, conflict uh, yeah. that you have and that, that tur turmoil and that loneliness in your heart. So it is a, a problem here and um, we want to fix it. We want to make it better. But um, before we go on, Gary, um, <clears throat> I know that you were also a very successful um, businessman. You ran a construction company here in Hawaii. And um, I was also very intrigued when I heard, how did you sustain your business throughout the last two years during this COVID incident? Another, you have great questions. <laughs> you know, uh, I've been, you know, uh, the only jobs I've ever had where I actually worked for somebody was a, I worked as a dishwasher, my first job at a steakhouse and my second job, actually I had three jobs. Second job was at a gas station and then a car lot, a car dealer. And then my friend said, hey, you want to try construction? And I said, oh, well, yeah, okay. And it was a huge raise. And when I came to Hawaii, I just said, well, why, why wouldn't I try this? And so we start, I just launched the business simply because I knew how to actually perform the task. And then I just worked my way through the learning process of what it meant to estimate and understand rules and regulations and insurance and estimating and project management. And those just happened over the years. It was just trial and error, talk to people, get wisdom, look at people who are doing things and are successful, look for people who have integrity and do what's right, and follow them. Life is, a, life, is, life is a process of gaining wisdom. And wisdoms are all around us. If we would just have a heart, we would just say, yes, I'll just ask. And, you know, we have not because we ask not. And so I asked and I just asked people and worked and then I just worked hard. And ultimately, uh, Kingdom Builders was birthed in 1995. And uh, it's actually a DBA, but it was birthed in 1995. And we did all, all types of projects, you know, federal work, homes, a lot of, we built a lot of churches, a lot of schools, we still do, uh, making it through the last, uh, last couple of years through COVID, it actually is not an accident, I mean, people think, well, how can this be, you know, and, and, and this will be hard, maybe hard for people to understand, but the Lord told me about six years ago that he was going to change things, and I don't know uh, for your own personal experience, but it's hard to change, it's really hard to say, I'm going to stop doing what I've done for 40 years and do something different. And it took a great deal of courage for me to actually do that. So actually two years ago, the, the financial faucet just basically turned off. It was incredible. We had contracts fall out that we had in place pre-COVID, a couple of large contracts, and that just stopped. And in construction, there's a, there's a rhythm. You know, you, you, you're, you're estimating all the time. You're working on uh, getting the contracts in place. And then you start work. Well, that, that duration is sometimes months, that process. And so those jobs fell out and, and uh by the grace of God, we just hung on. We just, I saw, honest, honestly, we hung on. We saw, we saw what was whatever reserves we had disappear. And, but I knew, I knew in that process that God was doing something and it had nothing to do with his provision. We never, I have never gone without, nor have my kids ever gone without. And that's his promises that we would not go without. And it hasn't been the same, but nobody traveled. So I don't know what difference that makes, but you know, uh, it was really rough. And uh, uh, so things are better now. You know, we're working. The guy, we're quote, we remember we were quote essential, which never made any sense to me at all. <laughs> get the idea of deciding who's essential and not essential. I say everybody's essential. Everyone knows. Nobody's non-essential. These are these terms are are uh, I don't know I, I don't know where people came up with that, but nevertheless, we survived. Uh, God has been faithful. This is a season of change for Kim and I. And uh, we look forward to what's next. And I know there's a lot in front of us. And so we're exceedingly excited, full of faith. And yeah. uh, you know, this, yeah, yeah uh, I know that you had um, an opportunity to meet with a lot of different clients and potential customers that were seeking maybe home improvement, because I know a lot of home improvements went on during yeah. the last couple of years because they were stuck at home. So I know that you were meeting a lot of customers. What were some of the concerns that they had about investing into their homes or investing back into Hawaii? Well, initially in the first, I would say the first six or eight months, pe most people that I met were really unsure how to even make decisions about the next 30 days, let alone invest in a big project. You know, the same dynamics that, that larger projects, schools or churches had 
families were going through. Should we, should we remodel? Should we do this now? Should we build a new home now? Because we, they were uncertain because of all things COVID, right? There was so much fear being released in our communities. They were unsure. And then the process of actually getting those people to act from a place of, we really want to do this to understanding what was required and how much it was going to cost. And then they would go through the entire budget process. So I would say the process was really about spending time illuminating and creating options. Most construction projects have this piece called value engineering, where people have, you've heard the term, they have a wine taste, but a beer budget, right? (laughs) Everybody wants, and I always tell people, listen, you should just go for whatever you want. And if you don't have enough resources, we'll prioritize and we'll back down the project until you can afford it. And that's not normal. Most contractors don't do that. But I'll just sit with people for months and working through their hopes and dreams and visions and exploring opportunities in different ways that they might initiate a project and bring it into completion. So that's, that's kind of what I do. Uh, I love people. I love listening to their dreams. And so you just listen and offer solutions. Right. I, that's kind of what I do. So, yeah. So I, I might say that you were blessed in the last two years because you were hearing about the health and well-being of so many others and the issues, the problems of them just trying to survive and trying to hear the truth of the day. But unlike most citizens, Gary, I know you didn't sit back. I know you didn't sit back and just, oh, it's me, or oh my gosh, what are we gonna do? Or I know that you took action. And instead, of, instead you organized a group, and I, I hear it's called the AFC or the Aloha Freedom Coalition. So please tell us a little bit about this and um, what, how was this all birthed? Yeah, you know, uh, AFC or the Aloha Freedom Coalition was really birthed out of a group of people who knew something was wrong in our community. It didn't take long, even myself, when the, when the first COVID things came out and these conversations like essentially non-essential, I first paused and I, I thought to myself, wow, this could be really serious. And I, I didn't just jump the gun and say, oh, this is nothing. But ultimately, uh, after, you know, after the first round, 60 days was over and I began to see things that were incongruent, people started to say, this is not right. And so we formed this group called Aloha Freedom Coalition, and which its principles are Aloha, that we would exercise everything in love and reach in love, that we would illuminate the truth. We would actually, we, we began to see throughout all mass media, th- through, you know, we began to see the coercion of government. We began to see the censoring of people, experts, doctors, these kinds of people who had important things to say. And it went against my grain of gaining wisdom. It didn't make sense to me. And s- more and more, these non- con- nonsensical decisions were coming out of our government that were being issued from the CDC or FDA. And uh, so we formed a Aloha Freedom Coalition as an, as an organization to, f- to stand for liberty for the individual. We began to see individual rights being, uh, being suppressed and constrained. And so we just said, we're forming this uh, coalition so that people have the right to exercise their civil, civil rights, understand their bill of rights. And then in that, they can exercise their self-government and understand how to, how to be free. So that organization started with uh, in my living room. You know, I put up, I put up five, five easels, four easels, and I said, one of the most important elements of our society, and they were the church, they were media, they were business, and uh, I can't even the fourth one. But I put these easels up, and I just asked the people in attendance, which one matters to you? Go right. stand by this evil and or- organize yourself. And so they elect a leader. And then we began to formulate an idea and uh, Aloha Freedom Coalition uh, exists today as a information centers for, for the globe. If you need help with medical wellness, if you need help with uh, uh, business, with political things, with preparedness, there's these information centers where they can go to the website, access information. And we've, over this time, over this last two years, we've built this vast summary and uh, 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 information for people, you know, to get help. And so it's really an organization designed to help the people. Uh, it sounds like, to me like it's a resource organization. Absolutely. So, and that's what people need, especially people like me who are <clears throat> not computer savvy and I don't know where to go for information. So it sounds to me like it would be a one-stop shop that I can go with my silly questions and, and not get laughed at. And I yeah. would get some direction. And so I think it's very valuable at this, especially during those critical times that we just went through. Um, I have a question from the audience and it's, is AFC a faith 
faith-based organization? Well, technically, it's not a faith-based. We didn't establish it as a faith-based. It's nonpartisan, non-religious. Uh, but it's interesting that a lot of a lot of people who are really willing to stand and serve in other people are faith-based people. That doesn't mean that there is the entire spectrum of people in AFC. And AFC was a is a liberty-based organization. So there, there was a, there's not a there's there is a, there is a way to be a member to help support AFC to function. But it's not a membership like where we become like-minded. A like-minded peace is liberty. And so uh, we're, we're, a, we're, a new, we're a number of the original leaders and those who had a vision for, for freedom, were they faith-based? Of course they were, I am. And, uh, but does that mean that there weren't, were there, there were others that were not? Yeah, oh, there was plenty of people that were not, you know? Right, uh, right. You know, Gary, I know um, by hearing you, I know that you're a man of God and that God has a big part of your life's journey. So just please share with us, when did you accept the Lord into your life? Yeah, that's a great question. Now, I, I actually accepted the Lord when I was 19. I, I actually asked him on a date. Oh. I was involved in auto racing as a young man, <laughs> and I met her at some auto races. And I, I, I tell you, I, I, was, uh, I was wicked in every way. You know, I was, I was all about the wrong things. And I asked her on a date, and she said, how about church? I said, what? <laughs> I was like, yeah. Well, my church maybe, maybe on Easter. And I had no idea what it meant to be a Christian, to know what it means to be embraced the Son of God. And, and, I, and I, she, I went to church and I noticed something. I noticed that people actually loved each other. I, I hadn't experienced that before. Uh, and the next day, uh, I, I asked the Lord into my life. I said, and I didn't really know what I do. And Kim actually saw what was going on. She said, oh, you left your Bible in my truck by accident. I saw her the next day. And uh, so she, she <laughs> talked to me about what it was to be born again. And it was an immediate 180 degree turn. Wow. I had the manner that was like the worst. It was it, it was just gone. It wasn't like I decided to stop smoking. It was literally just gone. Oh, wow. I'm over to my truck and I'm throwing out all this drug pill. <laughs> and and all the, it was all gone. Wow. Complete new wow. So that was so, when I was. Sounds like to me um, at, at 19, you received the Lord. You found the love of your life. So spiritual health is a key. Spiritual health is a key to your success. I can see it. Is yeah. it that simple, right? <laughs> is it that simple, Gary? Well, actually, you know, it's, it's free. God give it to us free. Yeah. All we do is say yes. It's that simple. It's not complex. It's, mm -hmm. it's my own. It's my own. I, I, I need to do this and I need to do that. It gets in the way. I, I have to choose. It's not that. It's he's, he's given his gift. And for me, it was like, and you know what he said to me? He honestly said to me, when I was weeping after I met her that night, I didn't, I was, and I'm 19 years old. I'm on my way home. I'm weeping in my car. And I'm asking myself, what is going on? This went on for 20 minutes. <laughs> and I got to my driveway and I said, what is going on? And he said, gently, he said, you've never known what love is. Wow. That was it. Wow. Like, beautiful, Gary. So beautiful. Yeah. That's wow. the real thing. Yeah. You know, I was trying to Google you to find out some information on you. And I, I found out that you were an active member or a board member of the Waikiki Beach Chaplaincy. What was your role there? Well, when we first moved here, Kim's mom and dad, I mentioned that they had, they had lived here. They were actually uh, missionaries with the Waikiki Beach Chaplaincy. Oh. So when we arrived, we immediately started going down and serving at the beach in Waikiki behind, behind the Hilton. With That's Pastor uh, uh, Magangas? Well, he, not, not now. So now uh, One Love is actually overseen it. Uh, Pastor McGain has passed away. Right, so, right. Absolutely. So anyway, but back in those days and back in, you know, 1979 or 1981, we served at the beach for, you know, until the kids were born until 86, you know, and then we did all kinds of street ministry and wow. we had a bookstore, we had our Bible studies we had all these things going on. It was something nearly every night of the week. And then uh, we moved to Kailua the kids were raised, uh, and then I went back to the chaplaincy and served as a board member, and still I'm a board member there. Wow. And I still speak at the beach. I used to speak there quarterly, but things are changing. Right. And it's a great joy. It's a great joy to, to share the love of God in an open-air setting like the beach service. So I love it. I love it. I also volunteered as a speaker uh, back at their church. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, is it Ahuo or uh, in... in on the, at their facility and we had coffee and donuts um, like on in the mornings and snowbirds from all over would come and listen to the speaker of the day and 
it was a great time. I went for the donuts, of course, but you know, no, it was a great time. It was a great time. But now let's move on. I recently heard on the news, I saw it on the news. I thought, oh my gosh, I got to get you on, that you are so passionate about the, the health of our state that you are considering or actually running for governor for Hawaii. How did you come to this decision, Gary? Wow, you know, that's a, <laughs> uh, it was an amazing experience, actually. I started hearing about a year ago, people started saying things to me, you should consider running for office. And I, I, I just like, I, that's just, I said, that's fantasy. I don't know, you know, and then somebody else would say something and then somebody called and, and said from the mainland, you should, the Lord said, you should run for governor. And I still blew it off. And then another closer friend said to me, asked the same question. She said, I, the Lord told me that you, you're to be governor of Hawaii. But when she said it, I knew her. And I knew, I knew that she heard the Lord's voice. And I thought, oh, that kind of resonated a little bit different. I still dismissed it outright. I, there wasn't no choice. You know, I just like, oh, whatever. <laughs> and uh, maybe about uh, two months ago, I started having these experiences with God. It, they were, uh, even though I've been a Christian you know, for all these years and born again in, in the spirit, and, uh, his presence became so overwhelming at these, these times where I, it would end up on the ground and just weeping and just you know can imagine the whole snotty nose the whole deal and i'm th and i'm going what is going on it was like when i got saved it was like uncontrollable it happened once it happened twice it happened a third and then a f finally i told my wife kim i said honey i don't know what's going on god's doing something in me i don't have to know what it is i don't know what it is but at the same time people started keeps more and more people kept saying this and uh then i brought it up to our prayer group and i said you know, would you pray with me about this would you just consider it and uh ultimately uh, I was outside and early, I get up early in the morning. That's my time when it's dark, 4.35, something like that in the morning. And I'm outside praying and I said, okay, Lord, if, if this is you, uh, okay, I'll, I obey, I, I will obey. Wow. And immediately there was immediate clarity and everything went. Psh! Wow. Okay. So we're running really quick, short on time, but I uh, just got to ask. What yeah. did your wife Kim say about all this in a couple of words? When I walked in, I told her what I, I told her what I felt the Lord was saying. She said yes. Yes. Uh, no resistance in her. And I there said, you Are you go. willing to lose everything for this? And she said yes. Yes. That's all we needed. The That's yes awesome. from the wife. <laughs> wow. So uh, yeah, here we've run out of time for today. I know we could go on and on and we just got started. But I'd like to say mahalo to you, Gary Cornery, for the man who believes that the greatest gift of all is ohana. That's my awesome. Lord, my wife, and the ohana around us. So blessings to you as you embark on your campaign. I'm Wendy Lowe. We'll be back in two weeks. We'll see you then. Aloha, everyone. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.